Hi sir, one of the ER doctors. Um, just wanted to come see how you're doing. So could I ask you, what made you want to come to the emergency department five days ago on Monday? Uh, it got to the point where my chest, heart, and ribs all felt like it was in a vice. And I just, I couldn't wait any longer. Okay. So what had been going on for, before you came in? What had been going on with you? Uh, nothing really. Just, it, it, I guess, slowly got worse and worse. And it got to the point where I haven't been able to get out of bed for like a month. Okay. And what do you mean? What was getting worse? The, the breathing, the coughing, the pain. Okay. So you had been having chest, chest pain. pain. What side was your chest pain? The, this side. The, 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 the left, left side? side, yep. Okay, gotcha. So you were having left sided chest pain, you were having some <laughs> difficulty breathing, yeah. and some coughing, it right? Just a non stop cough, and I would cough up a, almost like a fluid. Uh huh. Like a runny egg flavored fluid. It was gross. Okay. But that's, and it was constant. That's why right, it's kind of new, so was up. Yeah. And for how long had that been going on? Uh, since about the middle of about a month and a half. Oh, okay. All right, so I am going to stop sharing my screen right now. Okay, so based on this patient's first initial symptoms, so you see he came into the ER with chest pain, worsening cough, shortness of breath, lethargy. Um, what do you think could be going on with this patient right now? So I'm going to pull, I'm going to put up our first poll. And you should be seeing that poll and go ahead and answer what you think could be going on with this patient. I see lots of people answering. Let me give you some more time. We're at 75% of our participants have answered. It looks like pneumothorax is winning the race here. We're at about 90% answered. Almost all the way there. I'll just give a few more seconds for anybody who hasn't answered yet. All right, so I am not going, I'm gonna end the poll, but I am not going to reveal the answer just yet. I just, I'm going to finish playing the video so we can collect some more information about this patient. And then I'll give you the results. Had that been going on? Uh, since about the middle of about a month and a half. Oh, okay. Any any trigger, anything that started it for you? Uh, yeah, I had a tree branch hit me in, a, in the ribs. Oh. And I think that might have. That's unfortunate. How long ago was that? That was the, about the middle of August when all the storms started happening. Oh, gotcha. I was cutting trees down for my parents. Oh, okay. And a, a limb fell and turned around and swung and hit me and knocked me off the ladder. Oh, okay. So I'll stop sharing my screen. So we now know that uh, this patient had some chest trauma. So I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint and I will share my screen um, about a little bit about chest trauma so we can learn some more about this. Okay, so chest trauma, as we can see here, chest uh, trauma can be penetrating or can be blunt. Um, let me move this box right here, hopefully, so we can see. Okay, um, so if the injury pierces through the skin, such um, that would happen with a stabbing or a gunshot wound, it would be considered a penetrating chest trauma. If the injury does not pierce the skin and muscle, then it isn't the main cause of tissue damage, you would consider the injury to be blunt force chest trauma. So car accidents and falls cause the most frequent blunt force chest traumas. 
and gunshot wounds and stabbings cause the most type of penetrating chest traumas. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, before I do that, I'm just going to reveal the results <laughs> from our um, first poll that this patient did indeed have some chest trauma. So if you picked chest, chest trauma in our first poll, then you were correct. But the rest of you aren't all the way far off. So um, let's, let's finish uh, the video. Hey, Leah, Janny jumping in here. I think we shared the second question of the poll. So folks might be seeing slightly different answers than what Leah shared, um, but just wanted to share that with you. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Well, let's finish the video and we can always go back. Did you did you get medical help at that point or no? No, I just... Uh took a couple ibuprofens right. and called yeah. it a day fearing it'll you know get better tomorrow. Gotcha. And then tomorrow it turned into a week, a week turned into a month. Yeah. A month and a half turned into me coming in here. Oh, okay. So that was almost one and a half month ago, right? Yes. Okay. So just a little bit more about like when you came into the ED on Monday, your main complaint seems like was chest pain and coughing, yeah. difficulty breathing. Yeah, the breathing, coughing, chest pain, yes. Yeah. What was the pain like? Uh, it's well, pain was probably like around in seven in your guys' system. Um, once they got the tube in and everything, it was like a one. Gotcha. Um, but I think it was just because it was, it was hitting the infection and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, anything was anything that was making it worse for you, the pain? Uh, moving, moving. Just okay. Basically gotcha. Breathing, coughing. Yeah. Anything was making it better and, for you? Yeah. I'm sorry. What What were the things that were making the pain better for you? Um, nothing. Uh, I mean, they gave me like pain meds. It was it made it uh, tolerable. Gotcha. I, I just been. I think I just been so uncomfortable for so long. Yeah. That everything is extra tender, extra sore. Gotcha. Extra. I I basically waited too long to come in. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, the pain med medication made it bearable and uh -huh. uh, somewhat comfortable. But gotcha. Any any associated symptoms like were you having any nausea, vomiting? Uh, no, not since I've been in here. No. Okay. No, when you came to the ED on Monday. Yeah. No, everything. I've been. Yeah. Everything's good. Were you having any fevers? Yeah. Oh yeah, I broke into fevers. I had pneumonia. Yeah. Um, I was in and out of fevers. Yeah. For how long had you been having fever before you came in? I uh, in uh, pretty much the whole month. For the whole month. Yeah, I'd be in and out of it, but then like two days, I'd wake up and a puddle of sweat. Gotcha. So the fever broke. Gotcha. You know, but then yeah. it come back at like the next day. It was okay. All right. Do you do you have any medical conditions? Uh, just P I have PTSD from, from okay. work and stuff like okay. that. Okay. Okay. Have you had any surgeries done on you before? Uh, yeah, I just gave my left shoulder when I was in high school. Oh, okay. Um, All right. That's about it. Nothing other than that. Nothing other than that. No. Were you on any medications? Uh, nope. Well, I used no. to be like on the antidepressant and, and a bunch of that stuff, but I got off of okay. that. Okay, got that's off what of I that. thought. That that's what actually brought me in to the Guilford one was I thought that had something to do with it, coming off of like the Lexapro, okay, or, and all that stuff. But then yeah. I started realizing this is more physical than mental. Gotcha. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, so. yeah. Were you having any weakness, fatigue? Or? Yeah, like, I, haven't get, I haven't been able to get out of bed in a month. Oh, okay, in a month. Literally a month like in bed. Gotcha. What was your trigger that you decided that okay now you have to come to the ED? I just couldn't deal with it anymore. It was just too okay. much. Okay. Which one? Which one was the worst? The pain, coughing, or the pain and the coughing? Both. And okay. The breathing. It was the gotcha. Gotcha. And I haven't slept in like three weeks at that time. So. Okay. So some personal questions: Do you smoke tobacco, like cigarettes? Uh, occasionally. Occasionally. Obviously Alrighty. not. Since this all went down. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like um, four days ago, you were in the emergency department. You had this diagnosis of a, kind of like a pyothorax, so it's all like blood, some air, and some purulent collection of bacteria. And you got a chest tube in the ED, it seemed like it was not draining, so you got admitted, and then you went underwent a video assisted procedure, mm -hmm. um, and you got three chest tubes put in. How do you feel today? With, 
honestly, it it's, it probably doesn't make sense, but it feels better with the three tubes than it did with the one. Less okay. painful. Gotcha. It, it's, I feel so much better. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's because they drain the stuff. I, I, I don't know, but it's yeah. way less painful with the three than it is okay. with the one. Okay. Do you think we can see the side where the chest tubes are? Okay, so it's all covered with the dressing, so we won't we won't remove the dressing. All right, that's good. You can have you, you can put your gown back on. Just gonna record the CT scan. Right, so this guy seems like he's he had quite a traumatic injury here. Um, I'm going to uh, let's look at these vitals and demographics. So we have a 40 year old male. He comes into the ER. We know he has some type of chest trauma, and um, his temperature as 98. Uh, his blood pressure is 123 over 75. Heart rate is 95. Respiratory rate is 22. So the blood pressure is pretty normal. Um, heart rate is on the higher end of normal. Respiratory rate is definitely abnormal. Um, and we can see here that he had trauma to the left chest, falling tree branch, um, left-sided chest pain, difficulty breathing, increased productive cough. Um, now he has worsening fatigue, some night chill, nighttime chills, um, and pain. <clears throat> so I just want to take a look at, uh, take a kind of a, uh, deeper look at chest trauma before we talk about what we would do for this patient. So I am going to pull up my PowerPoint here. So we know that he had trauma. He had blunt chest trauma um, and it wasn't penetrating, this is blunt. Um, this is a sudden forceful injury to your chest and uh, can be caused by a car, motorcycle accident, blast injury, or fall. It may also be caused by a sports injury, such as a hit from a baseball. It may be painful to take deep breaths. It may cough and sleep. Um, and so blunt force trauma can cause a pneumothorax, a hemothorax, and a hemopneumothorax. Um, so just keep that in mind. I am going to go back to um, our video for just a second, and I'm not going to play it. I just want you guys to see something here. So now you know what happened to this patient. You see all the vital signs. Now I want you all to pretend that you are the clinician. You're the nurse practitioner. You're the physician's assistant. You're the doctor. Um, what kind of what kind of tasks are we going to order for him? What are What's the workup going to look like? What are we going to do to fully diagnose this patient? So um, go ahead and just throw your answers into the chat. I just want to see where you all are going, like how you're thinking and what your thought process is. The chat is disabled. Okay, I see. 
Jani, could you please um, enable the chat for us? Yep, it should be um, enabled now. Try again. Thank you. Thank you so much. So again, I would love to know what your thoughts are. What do you think is going on with this? Or I want to know what is your workup? So you're the PA, you're the nurse practitioner, you are the doctor and you have this patient. So what, are, what kind of tests are we gonna do in the ER? Yes, I see ABGs, I love that. X-ray, um, yes, CT, MRI, EKG. Yes, all of those are correct. I love it. Keep it coming. You guys are definitely on the right track chest x-ray, um, white blood cell count. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Definitely blood work. Definitely for sure. Yes. So you guys are on the right track. <clears throat> I love it. And yep, absolutely. EKG, CT scan, blood work. Absolutely. Blood cultures. Absolutely. Yeah. He has fevers, night chills. Um, yeah. Blood cultures for sure. We need to know if there's an infection. Um, all right, so let me uh, share my screen again. And sorry about that. Let me go back here. All right, so let's see what they actually did. Let's see what they actually did. So this is the patient workup. So this is actually what this, what they did in, in the ER while he was there. This is what they did. So you all were on the right track. You CDC, the complete blood count. CMP, we did a coagulation panel. I'll tell you about that a little bit more if you're unfamiliar with it. And the next um, here shortly, a type in screen, EKG, of course, uh, chest X-ray, chest CT, blood culture. So you guys were definitely on the right track. You were, you know, definitely, definitely on the mark. Uh, so let me pull this up. Let's move on. Um, and we can see that, uh, well, let me go back. Sorry about that. So the medical diagnostic workup, you can see the vital signs. So obviously that's obviously that is number one. When you first come to the ER, we're doing all these vital signs, right? CBC is the complete blood counts. This measures several components and features of your blood, including your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your hemoglobin, which is the oxygen carrying protein in your red blood cells, um, your hematocrit, your platelets, which helps with blood clotting. You're also gonna do a, a CMP, which is a complete metabolic uh, panel. And that uh, provides really important information about the body's chemical balance and metabolism. It shows all of these things here, your glucose, your calcium, your sodium, your potassium, um, your carbon dioxide, uh, your alkaline phosphate, um, all of your liver enzymes. Um, also um, the BUN, which is the blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine, and those are indicative, will show um, how well your kidney is functioning. Uh, these coagulation panel, so that's when we were talking about the PT and INR, and that test measures the blood's ability to clot and how long it takes for the uh, blood to clot. Type and screen, so the type and screen determines both the ABO and RH of the patient um, and screens for the presence of most common antibodies. So if you're in the ER, if you're working the ER, these are all things blood work that's going to happen with most patients. The type and screen has to be done uh, before a patient's, well, I shouldn't say has to be done. Should it be done if it's possible um, before the patient receives a blood transfusion? But there are times in especially level one trauma ER when you don't have time to get a type in screen and you're just mass transfusing blood. Um, but that wasn't the case here. But if there is time, yes, you definitely want to collect a type in screen. 
We're gonna also do an EKG and that is an electrocardiogram records the electrical signals of your heart, the chest X-ray, of course, um, and then a chest uh, CT. And that CT scan is, um, Obviously it's an imaging test. It's gonna give you better pictures than a chest X-ray does. And what's different about the chest CT and it's very kind of hard to explain. So if you would imagine a patient is lying on their back, which is the supine position, the CT takes pictures of sagittal views. So it's like if a patient is lying on their back, the CT, if you would just take a slice of a patient, a slice of a person, and then you're viewing it like this. This is, that's how a CT scan reads. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. And I'm not a doctor, so I, <laughs> I'm not allowed to actually uh, interpret those CT scans, but, um, you know, being a nurse for so long, you, you just learn to look at them and know what, how, how that is, uh, how the pictures are taken. Okay, so moving on here. I did, I definitely wanted to move on to our blunt force trauma. So again, we know about this blunt force trauma it can cause the pneumo, chemo, and hemi pneumothorax. Um, <clears throat> so what I know, what do you think the real diagnosis is for this patient? So I will stop sharing my screen and go back here. And let's see if we can pull up. So this was the first question. And we'll see if we can get to the second question. I don't know why it won't. So this was really the first question and we went backwards, but if for the first question, yes, chest trauma, rib fracture. So again, we went backwards, but yes, this absolutely, this is chest trauma for sure. And pneumonia is not wrong. He did also have pneumonia. So if you pick pneumonia, you are definitely not wrong. Um, 76% of you answered. I am going to end the poll here very shortly in a couple of seconds, but yes, chest trauma, we know that. And pneumonia, if you pick that, you are not wrong either because yes, he definitely did have a pneumonia. So we're all thinking you guys are all on the right track for sure. So. I am going to go ahead and end the poll. So chest trauma is right. I'm gonna move on here <clears throat> and share my screen. Um, and we'll close that door. So the actual diagnosis for this patient after the whole workup that we did and you guys were all uh, did so well with trying to figure out what kind of tests we would give to this patient if you were the clinician in the ED that night or that day. Um, but this actual patient's diagnosis was left-sided loculated infected chemo pneumothorax. So those are really big words right there. Loculated, we didn't talk about that yet, and hemo pneumothorax. So I want to pull up um, my PowerPoint here and I can see I kind of just put this here as left-sided loculated infected hemoneumothorax. And this is a combination of two medical conditions, which is a pneumothorax and a hemothorax. So a pneumothorax, um, which is also known as a collapsed lung, happens when there is air outside the lung. 
in the space between the lung and the chest cavity. And a hemothorax occurs when there is blood in the same space. So if you could imagine that now the lung is totally compressed and the lung cannot expand. Um, so this man really was could not even breathe on that side. So it makes sense that he had chest pain, that he had shortness of breath. Um, that he had fatigue because there was not enough, his lungs weren't making enough oxygen to perfuse to the rest of his body. So um, now loculated, what does that mean? So loculated means having forming or divided into loculi or loculated pockets of fluid or pus, which is usually infectious in the lung. So if you said pneumonia, you aren't wrong with that because he did have pneumonia because there was an, you know, an infectious component to this hemopneumothorax. So I'm going to move on and show you um, some pictures of that as well. So here, this, this, um, will give you a good idea. So here, all the way on the left hand side, an image of healthy lungs, the normal lung, the visceral pleura, the chest wall, where the diaphragm is, these are healthy lungs. Here's a pneumothorax. So again, this is when air, um, outside air enters due to, it enters into the lung space due to a disruption in the uh, chest wall in the parietal pleura. Hey, Leah. Yes. You can't see your image. You're oh, still you sharing. No, not okay. yet. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Let me go back. Mm, thank you for that, Gianni. Can we see now? Yep, I can see it. Perfect. Okay. So. Let's go through this again. Okay, so here is a um, an image of healthy lungs. So here you can see your normal lung, the parietal pleura, the visceral, the chest wall. The next image is of the pneumothorax. So you can see there's air that enters into the uh, chest wall and the parietal pleura because of some type of disruption. Um, and that's when the lung collapse, you see how it kind of shrinks and shrivels up. The next is the hemothorax. And this is just when blood enters the pleural space. And that can happen for the same reasons. It could be for chest trauma, blunt force or penetrating. Um, but this, this poor patient here, he got the double whammy. He got the hemonemothorax and that's when both air and blood enters into the pleural space. So that is why this man was having such a hard time breathing. So <clears throat> how do we treat this patient? So now we know what his diagnosis is. We know what's going on with him. Um, how, do, how do we treat him? So I will stop sharing my screen here. Um, and I will go back to our video. So our standards of care. So we already talked about the workup and again, you guys were all on the right page thinking about that. Um, so the suggested treatment, so immediate chest tube insertion by thoracic specialists in the ER, it's mostly the trauma surgeon um, or the ER doc, in this case, the who's a trauma doctor, um, but in the setting of loculated collection of VATS and antibiotics were indicated. So if you remember in the video, it in the, in the video, it said that he initially had one chest tube placed in the ER and that can be done at the bedside. It's, um, it, it's not, it's, it's not an easy procedure and it's the patient is usually awake when this happens. And, um, but you're doing that emergently, uh, to help reinflate the lung, um, and to drain the blood off of the lung. But, um, we know now know that he ended up with three chest tubes and 
how and why uh, did that happen? So before we go on to that, I just wanted to show you a little bit more about chest tube placement. So we see here that he had the chest tube placement to the left side and it's treatment for the hemo pneumothorax. And that's obviously aimed at draining the air and the blood in the chest with the hopes to returning the lung to a normal functional capacity. And the procedure involves placing that a hollow plastic tube between the ribs into the area around the lungs in order to drain the air and the blood. The tube may be connected to a machine to help with drainage. I just want to make sure that you all are seeing my screen. Okay. And so he needed then to go on to have a vast procedure because he had the chest tube placed in the ER um, and apparently that wasn't draining enough. It wasn't helping enough. So he needed to have a VAT. So what's a VAT? It's a video assisted thoroscopic surgery. So this is when the patient actually goes to the OR, they, you know, give them a, probably like a general anesthetic. Um, and during a VATS procedure, a tiny camera um, and surgical interest instruments are inserted into the chest through one or more small incisions in the chest wall. And the, score, the thoroscope transmits images of inside of the chest onto a video monitor, then where the surgeon um, or the thoracic surgeon can see uh, performing the procedure. So they get a, a really good idea of really what's um, going on with that patient. Let me just move on. And this is kind of what you can see uh, a chest tube look like this patient. This is not our patient that we were just uh, seeing on the video. This is another patient, but this is a patient with a chest tube. He has one. Our patient ended up with three, but this tube is then connected to this device here. It's called a Poravac. They don't all look like this, but they mostly all do. This is just the mo one of the most common um, and then this instrument is connected into the wall um, in the patient's room where there is suction and it's kind of pulling um, the air and the blood out into this container. And then you're measuring the drainage every eight hours. So, um, but as we saw in the video, our patient had three. He started off with one in the ED and then apparently that wasn't working. And maybe it was like the next day they took him back to the ER. Um, I'm sorry, back to, they took him to the OR to do the VATS procedure. And just a little bit more about his treatments. So uh, let me see. Stop sharing here. I wanted to go back to the video first. So um, what were his actual outcomes? So the left chest tube placement followed by the VATS, which we know. But then he needed frequent installation of TPA through the chest tube to help break down those lock elations. So why did that need to happen? So this patient was pretty complicated. Um, one, as we know, one chest tube was not helping to reinflate his lung and drain the blood out of the space. That's why he needed the VATS. And with that VATS procedure, the surgeon was able to have a better view with that camera to see actually what was going on in the lung and probably saw these loculations. Um, and let me show you a little bit about that. So again, um, these loculated having forming or divided into pockets of fluid. So these loculations 
can complicate a hemonumorthorax by preventing adequate chest tube drainage. So that makes sense that he had the chest tube place in the ED. Maybe the next day it was, they could see it really, he wasn't responding to that as he should. So he had the VATS procedure done and they could see that he had these loculations. And so how do they get rid of these loculations to help adequately drain the air and the fluid so we can return the lung to its a functional capacity? So they instilled TPA through the chest tube to help break up the loculation. So the loculations are very hard. The TPA is a very powerful naturally occurring protein um, found in endothelial cells and it and activates the conversion of uh, plasminogen to plasmin, which is an enzyme responsible for the breakdown of clot. So um, th the TPA was then injected or instilled through the chest tube into the lung to break down these loculations, um, allowing the blood and the air to drain um, and return the lung to its functional, best functional capacity. Um, so let me go back to video and we can see here that that is exactly what happened. The patient spent 20 days inpatient and that is a long time, especially in this day and age. Nobody spends 20 days in the hospital unless you are really sick or you have a lot, there's a lot going on. So um, he spent 20 days in the hospital, but apparently he made a full recovery. So that uh, ends our presentation here. I hope you all really, really loved it. Um, <clears throat> I know there's probably a lot of questions, so I will open up the question portion of our session. I won't be able to answer all of them, but if you have questions, you can put them into the chat and I will try to grab onto as many as I can. Um, please, before that, don't forget at the end that um, we will provide you with that um, discount enrollment code uh, for $300 off of enrollment into any one of our courses if you're not already a student with advanced clinical training. Um, and also we have a post-session post survey we would love for you to fill out. We like to collect, um, you know, just feedback from our audience about our webinar, how we can make it better. And also if you want to suggest any topics that you would love to see uh, us present in the future, we would love to hear from you. So what are some of your questions? So I see, was the pneumonia secondary to the trauma? Yes. So the pneumonia was secondary to the trauma. Um, anytime you have fluid collecting into the lungs, um, there is fluid or matter, I should say, there is potential for um, pneumonia. So um, yes, the pneumonia was secondary to the trauma for sure. Uh, any other questions? Let's see. I am trying to get to them. I can't, I see like there's more questions coming in. I can't see them all. But I do appreciate you all spending your time here with us on a Friday evening and attending our webinar series. Um, again, if you're not already a student here with Advanced Clinical Training, we'd be thrilled to have you. Webinar 300 is our discount enrollment code, uh, Jenny, if you could please place that into the chat for everybody. Um, that would be helpful, uh, webinar 300. So that is our discount enrollment code. Um, you will also receive a, uh, 
a certificate to the email that you use to sign up for the webinar um, for one hour of clinical shadowing um, because you joined us and we're so happy that you were here. Any other questions? Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, I do have a question. What types of symptoms should um, folks look out for when you're looking at possibilities for things like pneumonia or any sort of chest issues? And at what point should you go to the ER? Um, well, you know, we always tell people if you're having chest pain or shortness of breath, you should always just go right to the ER. There's no, you know, if you're at home, you're, you know, you're, you're a lay person. If you know, you have chest pain, you have shortness of breath, you go right to the ER. Cause that could be anything. Um, but you know, if worsening lethargy, if you have a, a fever, um, definitely fever, fatigue, shortness of breath, all things pneumonia related, if you have a productive cough, if you're coughing up, you know, blood, obviously, even if it's just a small amount, people don't generally just cough up massive amounts of blood. It's usually like, you know, the sputum is usually like pink tinged and, you know, people don't think, well, maybe this is okay. I mean, it's not that bad. Definitely you want to go to the ER, but fevers, chills, um, lethargy, feeling fatigue, um, all of those things, definitely you want to seek medical attention for right away. Thank you. Thank I'm you. In the chat as well, I don't see any additional questions. I know I see a, a comment about a question related to our training program. So if you can put that in the chat, we will do our best to answer it. If we don't have an answer today, we will follow up via email, um, but please feel free to post any questions related to either today's session or if you have any questions about any of our um, certification programs. Yes, please do. What is so, what happened, what would happen if there was no electricity and you wouldn't have been able to use the Pluravac to drain the blood and air? So, um, this patient was in the ER. That's a good question. This patient was in the ER. They're at a, probably a level one trauma center. If they weren't, they're being transferred to a level one trauma center. Um, level one trauma centers have backup generators. So if the electricity ever does go out, there's backup generators. So there is always electricity. There's there that um, there's always electricity. So it was maybe not draining the blood and the oxygen because of the loculations. And so that is what uh, ended up um, having this patient go to the OR to have a VATS procedure. So this is another question. Is there any labs on the phlegm the patient was coughing? That's a good question. So um, there are things Called, there's something called a sputum culture. And so usually the patient, if they can, they spit their sputum into a cup and we send it to the lab. And any type of culture, whether it's a blood culture or a sputum culture, any culture, a wound culture, it takes a, at least three days um, for anything to grow. So we um, generally if we think a patient has um, some type of infection like that, we generally treat them with a broad spectrum antibiotic until the culture grows um, the specific bacteria. Um, and then we know what specific antibiotic, uh, antibiotic to, we use to target that uh, bacteria. Um, but yes, there is a sputum culture. Yes, we, we do the use sputum culture. He said that it took him a month to go. Is that correct? It did take him a month to go to the ER. And we see this often. I mean, you see people come in and say they've been having these symptoms for two weeks. And then, you, you know, you do a workup on them and you find out they have these major things going on and you wonder how they survived like that. I mean, it sounds like he was a, you know, a, a young guy, 40 years old. He didn't have many, um, comorbidities. He didn't have other health complications. So he was, his body was compensating for a period of time and to the point where he just couldn't 
take it anymore. And he went to the, to the ER. He probably should have gone uh, what, right when he had those symptoms, but you know, generally men in their forties aren't running to the ER. You know, they, I mean, I don't want to, um, you know, you know, you don't want to uh, categorize people, but you know, they want to, they're tough. They don't think there's something wrong. They can handle it. And, and this is what happens if you wait that long. In terms of volume, after how much blood loss would blood transfusion be warranted? Well, that's a good question as well. It just depends on that, what we call hemo, your H and H, a hemoglobin and hematocrit. So um, if we have time to get that, then usually if the hemoglobin is below 7.0 is when there's the indication to um, replace the blood with a blood transfusion. Um, but in the in, in this instance, but in the instance of a trauma where you know there's already been massive blood loss, you're not doing um, you're not doing that blood work. You're just mass transfusing because you already know. A lot of good questions. I'm glad you guys are putting things in the chat. I'm so glad to hear that you were so um, engaged. Uh, what preventative advice would you have provided to him? Uh, well, I don't know if we could really prevent this type of injury. I mean, this was an accident, right? He was cutting down trees for his family or his parents because there was a storm. And so you can't really prevent these things from happening. Like you can't really fully prevent a car accident. Um, you know, you can't really fully prevent an assault. I mean, you can try to keep yourself out of these situations, but sometimes they just happen. They're accidents, you know? Um, of course, there's preventative advice you'd want to give to everybody. Like you don't, you know, don't smoke. Well, if you, you know, likely if you weren't a smoker and you had this type of injury, you're going to have a much better recovery. If you are healthy, uh, if you eat healthy, if you work out and you don't have comorbidities that are preventable, then your outcome when you have one of these accidents are going to be much better. Will the slides be posted in the email for certificate? So no, we don't, we're not going to post these slides. We do record these and, and we, we post them. I, I believe we post them on our YouTube channel. Um, but you will, again, receive a certificate for one hour of clinical shadowing. And that will be sent to your email that you use to sign up for this webinar. Um, Leah, I just want to um, quickly acknowledge a question about full scholarships. Um, affordability continues to be at the center of what we do for pre-health and pre-med students. So we do offer discounts and um, payment plan options for people who are students who are looking for those um, opportunities. But at this time, unfortunately, we don't have full scholarship for those who are looking to enroll in any of our programs, but that's something that we are working towards to, in the future. Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. We don't, um, at this time, we don't offer any um, federal financial aid or um, our full scholarships, but our uh, programs are priced to be very affordable and we do offer payment plans um, and we do offer um, another as assistance through um, another loan program that's uh, kind of like a, a private loan, but um, that is um you know, we can certainly provide information, detailed information for that if you would like. And Lee, I see another question in the um, Q&A box. What is the typical amount of time someone is in the hospital for? And why do you think this patient stayed for a longer amount of time? Well, it's hard to say what the typical amount of time is for this a type of injury because every patient is, is, is different. And with this patient, he had a complication, right? He didn't have just a pneumothorax or a hemi or a pneumothorax or a hemopneumothorax. He had a hemi pneumothorax. And the fact that he waited so long to come in, then he you know, also had pneumonia on top of that. So he really, that was the 
the complication and that's what kept him in the hospital as long as it did. Um, it, you know, the loculations, um, having the three chest tubes, draining the blood and reinflating the lung, um, uh, all of those things is what kept him in the hospital for, for 20 days. And um, had, he, had he come in sooner when he started having symptoms, uh, he, you know, would have been in the hospital for a, a lot less amount of time for sure. I see something in the chat about what kind of discharge instructions would you give to the patient? So um, I'm sure this patient was probably sent home. He completed, I'm sure, a, a course of IV antibiotics in the hospital is probably sent home with oral antibiotics. You always tell those patients, make sure you finish all of your antibiotics. Um, even if you start to feel better, you want to finish them until the end. Um, you know, you definitely want to complete your follow-up appointments with all of your doctors, which is probably a pulmonologist, which is a lung specialist. He probably, um, his primary care physician, and obviously the uh, cardiothoracic surgeons that provided care with the chest tubes and the vest procedures. Um, you know, definitely not smoking. He might've had to do some cardio, uh, cardiopulmonary rehab uh, just to get that lung working again. Um, so just to follow up with all of make sure he's following up with all of his appointments, um, refrain from smoking and being exposed to secondhand smoke, um, definitely immune support um, with, through eating healthy foods and probably taking some type of vitamin supplement as well. And then also, of course, if he had any type of you know, reoccurring symptoms, which would be the same, like chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, fevers, seek medical attention right away. Um, how do I feel about antibiotics being used in everyday medicine, although there have been reports of antibiotics killing gut flora? So that is a very, very good question. And there has been a very big shift. Um, when I first started nursing, it was like everybody, you know, they had the fever, they had this, like you just put them on antibiotics. Now there's been a big shift that unless we know for sure that the patient has some type of infection through whether it's we confirm that through blood cultures or a urine culture or sputum culture or a wound culture, we're not just prescribing antibiotics because there is the concern of antibiotic resistance. Um, and so that is why we are um, confirming with these types of cultures um, to make sure we're not over prescribing antibiotics for sure. And antibiotics can kill your gut flora. So it's killing the bad bacteria, but it's also killing the good bacteria in your gut and not some antibiotics are worse than others. And please don't anybody ask me exactly what the names of, of those are, but I generally tell people if you can take um, some type of probiotic while you're taking your antibiotic, that's always a really good idea to add some of that good bacteria back into your gut while you are um, killing the bad bacteria that's causing you your problems. All right, Leah, I think we have time for one more question and it is what complications would we need to be aware of specific to the lung reinflammation surgically and medically? Um, so those same, um, nothing new, just worsening chest pain, um, shortness of breath, a high respiratory rate, um, fevers, chills, um, low oxygen saturation, those are all things you would look out for a high, a fast heart rate because your heart's trying to compensate for your, your breathing. So a tachycardia would be one as well. Um, fatigue. So all of those things would be something you would want to look for in a patient that is not responding to initial treatment. So it is 5.59. I really just want to, again, thank everybody for joining us here uh, with uh, Advanced e Clinical Training's web webinar series. I hope that you come back and see us again real soon. Um, webinar 300 is your discount enrollment code if you're not already a student uh, with Advanced e Clinical Training. 
uh, please go over to our website and take a look at us. We would be thrilled to have you here. And again, you will receive that um, uh, certificate for one hour of clinical shadowing. And please don't forget to please don't forget to fill out your post session survey. Um, so we can collect feedback from you and also please provide to us any uh, topics that you would like for us to discuss in the future. Bye, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe.